All right, thank you, John, for the kind introduction. Uh, I really appreciate uh, that. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. I'm always looking for an excuse to come back to this uh, side of the bay, and I'm really glad I'm here. And thank you uh, all for coming here. So uh, I'm going to talk about some of the key kind of leapfrogging opportunities that exist in India's energy future and how uh, India is kind of uh, at a unique position right now to leapfrog to uh, some of the cleaner uh, energy future in the next one or two de uh, decades and why these two decades are kind of important uh, for changing the course of India's uh, energy policy. So I think John already talked about uh, where I work. So I work at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is a US DOE, and uh, the other university in the Bay Area managed uh, a lab, <laughs> uh, UC Berkeley. So uh, we are a fairly large group uh, in a sense that the lab is like more than 4,000 scientists, but we in the International uh, Energy Studies Department, uh, we are a fairly small group, about 20, 30 people working on India, China, uh, many Southeast Asian countries and several uh, African countries. All right, uh, so I'm going to quickly give you some overview of the energy sector in India, because which is quite different uh, from what we have been seeing uh, in the US or in Europe. And then I'll give you some very high level political economic context. And I'll kind of just as an illustration, talk about these four major leapfrogging opportunities. And th these are not by any means kind of an exhaustive list, but just as an indication, as an example uh, of big opportunities. Uh, room ACs in terms of enhancing their energy efficiency or also changing the refrigerants, uh, changing the uh, HFCs uh, with, with newer refrigerants. Uh, renewable energy uh, in India. Uh, transport electrification, switching to electric vehicles. And fourth is uh, 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 enhancing access to electricity uh, or energy broadly. All right. So uh, India is kind of expected to be one of the largest energy markets uh, in the next two to three decades. So between 2016 and 2040 or 2050, uh, India would be the largest contributor to the additional uh, energy demand that may come uh, in that time frame. So most of uh, the China's energy sector has kind of grown already. China is kind of reaching a, uh, a plateau. And India is where China was about 10 to 15 years ago. And that's why these next two decades are kind of important for India. So this, these two charts just show where India is and where China is and where US is. So this chart shows the number of cars per 1,000 people. In the US, we have about 800 to 900 cars per 1,000 people. Germany, about 600 cars. China, about 50 to 60 cars per 1,000 people. And India is way down here, about 15 on average cars uh, per 1,000 people. And this is kind of growing pretty rapidly. Uh, in terms of how much uh, coal and gas of electricity generation capacity exists in the country, China is like 1,000 gigawatts or one terawatt of coal and gas capacity. Mostly coal is roughly about 900 gigawatts of coal, 100 gigawatts of gas. Uh, and US, we are roughly about 800 to 900 gigawatts, uh, which is kind of split between coal and gas uh, equally. And India is only about 200 gigawatts, and it is expanding very, very rapidly. The population of India and China is approximately the same. So India could be where China is right now over the next two to three decades. And this has kind of two problems. Problem number one is there is uh, something called as committed carbon. So if this much of coal capacity or gas capacity already exists uh, on the ground, then it's very hard to kind of replace that old uh, stranded asset and uh, uh, replace that with the cleaner energy options. So it's much cheaper to do it uh, right the first time. And this is where India has this biggest opportunity. Uh, as I said, most of the energy infrastructure in India is yet to be built. For example, uh, India's electricity demand in 2030 is expected to be about 400 to 500 gigawatts. And it is today about 150 gigawatts. So we're talking about tripling of the electricity grid over the next 15 years or so. That's a significant increase, but most of that infrastructure is yet to be built. 
about 70% of the infrastructure, not just energy infrastructure, but roads and, uh, and, and natural gas pipelines and coal mines and so on and so forth, is yet to be built, which means that India kind of lags more than one to two trillion dollars in terms of stranded fossil assets uh, behind uh, that of China uh, and US. And that's why uh, it's kind of crucial to act now. Uh, this is just an overview of how India's energy mix is structured. So this is the total primary energy supply uh, in India. As you can see, is largely dominated by coal. More than half of India's primary energy is from coal. About 30% is from oil and about 20% from the other uh, sources. And this chart here shows the total electricity generation. So out of this coal, most of this coal, about 75% of the coal is uh, spent on generating electricity. And out of the total elect electricity, coal generates about 75% of the electricity. India doesn't have a lot of natural gas, uh, so only about 4 to 5% energy comes from natural gas, and the rest is from hydro, nuclear, and renewables. So the share of renewables, though, is kind of increasing pretty rapidly uh, in the last two to three years. So I think the key takeaway from this slide is that although India has not grown yet, most of the current energy supply is dominated by coal, and India does not have a lot of natural gas. So most of the newer additions to the energy supply will likely be from coal-based energy. All right, so this shows how much of India's energy is kind of imported. So this is coal, and this is gas. The bottom part shows the domestic production, and the top part shows the imports. As you can see, the coal imports are kind of gradually increasing. Roughly about 20% of India's coal is currently imported, and going forward, uh, it is going to be in that ballpark, expected to be in that ballpark, about 20 to 25% of coal uh, being imported. On the oil front, though, domestic production for the last 10 years, or so in fact, this line actually stretches back all the way to 1990, uh, is just flat. There is just no new oil discovery. So about 75 to 80% of India's oil is imported. And as India's transport demand, because of urbanization and rising incomes, is going to grow further, uh, all this newer demand is going to be met essentially only by imports. So this has kind of two major implications. One is, of course, the energy security of the country, where 90% of oil uh, is kind of imported, has serious implications for energy security. And second is uh, the vulnerab vulnerability of the country to oil uh, price and supply shocks, uh, which is quite significant. So in general, uh, about 40 to 50% of India's carbon, or about 40% of India's primary energy, is imported. So this kind of, uh, again, creates another opportunity where if the clean energy replaces the imported energy, then this kind of benefits uh, on, on multiple levels, ranging from energy security to price and supply shocks, and so on and so forth. All right, so all uh, this uh, is true, and also, the clean energy costs have been dropping significantly. As we are kind of experiencing that even in the US, the solar prices have dropped, the wind prices have dropped, and so on and so forth. But in India, the drop is fairly uh, dramatic. So this uh, chart shows the levelized cost of energy uh, from different energy sources, as you can see here. So solar, uh, solar PV, this is all solar PV. So in the last five years, the solar PV prices in India have dropped from nearly 12 cents per kilowatt hour to about 4 cents, maybe a little lower than 4 cents per kilowatt hour, or about 80% drop in uh, just five years. Are those subsidized? No, this is, this is no subsidy. This is all market-driven reverse auctions. Uh, and that's, uh, g g so this is something called, uh, uh, g g I wouldn't exactly call it policy innovation, but uh, so what India did is uh, India kind of, uh, the federal government in conjunction with the state governments kind of identified a good site for solar plants, identified uh, kind of credit where the buyers for the solar plants and guaranteed uh, a transmission connection 
and then did reverse auctions uh, on that specific site with all these guaranteed buyers and transmission connections. It takes away the integration risk, takes away uh, the, the purchasing risk, and so on and so forth. And that's why that kind of uh, uh, experienced this drop. And the most recent utility scale solar prices in the US are in the same ballpark, about four to five cents uh, per kilowatt hour. But you've left out the subsidy from the backup. Sun doesn't shine any more in India than it does here, so we have gas backup. You have coal backup. That's, so what, that's not in your price. That's exactly right. You hit the nail on its yeah. head. That's why people don't understand renewable energy. Absolutely. <laughs> so this is the levelized cost, and this does not talk about the value of solar, which may be which may be very different. So this is just the levelized cost, and you may have to spend extra uh, to make sure that you also have electricity in the night uh, and in the evenings when so the sun doesn't shine. You're absolutely right, and that's one of the major problems. Uh, so this is about the wind cost. So wind costs have been fairly flat for the last five years, and you can actually stretch this line even five years uh, uh, before 2012, and wind prices have been fairly uh, flat out. Uh, there has not been much change. Recently, there was another reverse auction similar to solar auctions for wind, and that kind of saw some drop in the wind uh, costs, but uh, which is not super significant. Now, the reason why the solar cost uh, reduction is kind of important is because it is already now competing with the coal uh, costs right here, which is about four to five cents per kilowatt hour, and is already lower than the imported gas-based electricity. India doesn't have a lot of domestic gas, so uh, most of the marginal units are essentially the imported gas-based units, and so it is already kind of competing favorably with the imported uh, gas units. However, the, the, one has to realize that one kilowatt hour from coal-based power does not necessarily equal one kilowatt hour from solar-based electricity because of intermittency, because of the seasonal nature, because of solar only generates during the middle of the day, and so on and so forth. So it's not a direct kilowatt hour to kilowatt hour comparison, but it is indeed uh, an important uh, comparison. So in terms of uh, energy efficiency, in, uh, so look at the LED prices. Uh, in India. So in India, uh, over the last two years, uh, they ran the world's largest LED program. So they distributed more than 200 million LED bulbs in a span of 18 months without any subsidy. And there are kind of, again, significant policy innovation there. What they did is a federal uh, energy services company, which is kind of typically unheard of. All the energy services companies are private, but India actually formed a federal government-owned energy services company. They invited global uh, uh, players uh, to bid uh, in, in, in India's LED market. They actually bought those LEDs and distributed uh, to customers uh, and kept some margin, of course. And that kind of brought the LED, because of the demand aggregation, uh, bought the LED prices down from about five to six dollars a unit in just September 2014, uh, less than three years away, uh, three years ago, to about half a dollar with the recent auctions that they have done. So then they have already distributed more than 220 million uh, LED uh, bulbs uh, in India so far. So what kind of this shows is uh, clean energy costs are dropping when most of the infrastructure is yet to be built in India, and which kind of uh, gives it some kind of political acceptance uh, because of uh, these, uh, uh, these falling costs. And as I mentioned, part of the cost reduction uh, is, of course, because of the global market trends, but the part is also driven by policy innovation with India's uh, reverse auctions on solar, with India's reverse auctions on uh, LEDs, and so on. All right. so. Another important aspect of India's uh, energy uh, sector is local environmental problems. So outdoor air quality, I don't know if uh, many of you have traveled to India, but outdoor air quality in India is one of the worst in the world. So uh, recently, last year, uh, the uh, average air quality in Delhi was actually worse uh, than Beijing. Beijing was supposed to be the worst air quality city in the world, but not anymore. It's now New Delhi in India as the worst air quality uh, city in the world. So outdoor air quality right here is already kind of fifth largest cause of 
premature deaths in India. And it's kind of uh, gaining increasing political traction uh, to act on these local environmental problems. And this is uh, just an example of air quality, but similar issues are kind of being raised for water quality, water shortages, and so on and so forth. So, so these local environmental problems uh, are also a driver uh, for some action on clean energy, especially uh, with the local governments and with some of the state uh, governments. Uh, so now these are essentially some of the opportunities uh, for clean energy, but also there are significant challenges. And one of the biggest challenge in case of India is kind of financially bankrupt uh, public electric utilities. So most of the electric utilities in India are publicly owned. Uh, while it kind of helps uh, uh, deliver some of the developmental objectives, but it also creates significant governance challenges. And one of the biggest challenges that the public ownership of the uh, electric utilities is the financial accountability or non-accountability for that matter. So this shows in fiscal year 2015, the total expenditure of all the utilities in India was roughly about $65 billion. Okay, and the total revenue that they earned was only about $45 billion. And the government put in about $10 billion of additional subsidy. And even with that, they're about $10 billion short uh, in, uh, uh, in, in just meeting their annual expenditure. So the financial loss in just one year is about $10 billion, which is roughly about 1% of India's GDP. Uh, and they, and this, this is not just one off year. This has been happening for the last several years uh, and the accumulated losses of all the public utilities have been in excess of uh, $100 billion. And the purchasing power parity, uh, uh, India's GDP is roughly about $2 trillion. So this is significant. Uh, and so this kind of also shows some limitations of the economic regulation. So India's electricity sector is exactly regulated as uh, it is in, uh, uh, in the US. So each state has its own public utilities commission that regulates the utilities. But in India, those utilities are public utilities and economic regulation does not always work with the public ownership. Uh, so while public ownership has kind of created significant governance challenges, on the other hand, because of public ownership of the electricity infrastructure as well as most of the fuels infrastructure, there is no organized private interest against clean energy. So which again kind of uh, acts as an opportunity uh, for some aggressive action uh, on, uh, on clean energy. All right, just to summarize, so there are kind of four key kind of levers for any energy action, and specifically clean energy action in India. Uh, cost, does it increase the cost for the utilities? Because utilities are financially bankrupt or on the verge of bankruptcy, so that's extremely important for the utilities. Second is what happens to energy security. As we saw, 25% of coal is going to be imported, 90% of oil is expected to be imported, so energy security is important, and also, access to energy. About 200 to 250 million people in India, which is about uh, uh, 20 to 25 percent of India's population, about 50 million households, lack access to electricity. They just don't have an electricity connection at their home. Uh, and so government is working on extending that access, but because of the public ownership of the utilities, it's been sluggish. It's been lacking behind. Uh, the third kind of driver is local environmental problems. And I've written air quality, but this is largely local environmental problems such as air quality. And fourth, which is a more recent kind of driver for energy action, is India kind of committed to fairly aggressive uh, NDCs uh, in the Paris Climate Agreement. So India committed to reducing its energy intensity of GDP by about 30 to 35%. Uh, by 2030, and India also committed to installing 175 gigawatts of renewables by 2020. I don't want you to get bogged down by the numbers, but the fact is that India did commit to fairly aggressive climate mitigation plan uh, in the Paris Climate Agreement, and uh, at least the federal government seems pretty driven uh, to achieve uh, those, uh, those targets, and there are significant policy actions that are being taken uh, 
uh, uh, for this achievement. All right, so with this background, let's quickly jump to uh, the key leapfrogging opportunities. So let's start uh, with Brew Macy's, then we'll move on to renewable energy, then we move on to transport, and then quickly uh, gloss over energy access. All right, let's look at room air conditioners. So this chart shows all the major metropolises around the world, all the major cities in the world, uh, ranked by their cooling degree days per year. So cooling degree days is essentially just a measure of how much cooling is required uh, in that specific city. Uh, so uh, higher the cooling degree days, which means the city is very hot or humid, and you need more air conditioner uh, use in that city. And the size of the uh, bubble essentially indicates the population uh, in, in those cities. Uh, so let's look at some of the most uh, populous Chinese cities, say Shanghai, Beijing. It's pretty populous, but pretty low on the scale of cooling degree days. Uh, let's look at Miami. It's pretty high on cooling degree days, but population not as high. Uh, let's look at uh, LA, right here, uh, Madrid, uh, Mexico City. And let's look at all the major Indian cities, Mumbai, Delhi, Calcutta, Chennai, uh, Bangkok right here from Thailand. Uh, so all the cities, very hot and very populous, which means that going forward, as people get richer, uh, the demand for room air conditioner is going, to be, uh, uh, is going to be increasing. And the reason that it's important is this happened in China. So I want you uh, to focus on this blue line, okay? Just focus on the blue line. Don't look at any other lines. Uh, this blue line, room air conditioners. So what this chart shows is the room AC penetration in China over the last 20, 30 years, from 1980s to 2010, okay? So look, and this is only urban China, okay? It does not include rural China. Uh, so look where the room AC penetration was in China around 1992, just when the country was kind of growing, incomes were increasing, almost non-existent, which means that uh, for every 100 urban Chinese households, hardly one or two had an air conditioner in 1992. Jump to 2007, 100 ACs per 100 urban Chinese households. So which means an addition of nearly 200 million air conditioners in a span of 15 years. And this means an addition of about 300 gigawatts of peak load. And 300 gigawatts, just to give you a scale of things, is five times or six times that of California grid. So this addition of six Californias with just one appliance in a span of 15 years. And this is the scale we are talking about. And this is exactly what we see India is. Uh, and this is India uh, was in 2014, right on this cusp. So in a span of 10 to 15 years, one can expect such explosive growth in ACs. And what we expect, and this is kind of also uh, uh, evident uh, from how the room AC sales have been growing in India, 15 to 20% growth each year for the last uh, 10 years or so, consistently uh, uh, growing. And room AC is kind of typically considered as one of the kind of those threshold appliances that people acquire once they uh, pass a certain income threshold. Uh, and this is kind of combined with the fact that room AC prices have fallen uh, by about 50 to 60% in real terms uh, over the last uh, decade uh, or so. All right, uh, and one last point I want to make is the Chinese AC penetration increased when their cooling degree days were really low. Indian cooling degree days are really high. So which means that ACs are the first appliance people want to buy once they cross a specific uh, income threshold. All right, and why ACs are important is because of this. One room AC, this is a conservative estimate, uh, consumes about at least 1,000 watts or one kilowatt of electricity at any given point. This is conservative. Actually, this is about 1,500 or so, but say conservative, about 1,000 kilowatts. And these are all the other typical appliances used in a middle class Indian household. Ceiling fans, incandescent bulb, tube lights, TVs, refrigerator, all put together, not even half 
of one air conditioner. And that's why this room AC demand is absolutely crucial and could be make or break for India's uh, electricity sector going forward. And what we estimate is uh, up to 2030, it can add up to about 150 gigawatts of electricity load uh, in, uh, in India's electricity sector. So if you can recall, India's current electricity load is about 150 gigawatts. So it's adding another India just by one appliance in the next 15 years. So these, this is quite significant. So addition of about 200 to 300 uh, large power plants. And of course, in India, power plants mean coal power plants uh, in the next uh, 15 years. All right. And this is kind of playing out uh, already uh, in, in the current utilities uh, and, and how g g room AC load is kind of shaping or uh, changing uh, India's grid. So for example, these are the load curves, which means uh, uh, the electrical load for each hour of the day in the two major cities. This is mostly residential commercial load, uh, high-end residential, high-end commercial load, pretty rich cities, Mumbai and Delhi, the richest, richest cities uh, uh, in, in India. So the blue line shows the typical day in the summer, and the red line shows the typical day in the winter. Look at this difference. This is all residential and commercial load. So why is the nighttime uh, load so different? It's essentially because of all the AC uh, load. Look at this afternoon peaking uh, load in summer and a dip in the afternoon in the winter because there is no AC load already. So this is essentially going to be quite crucial for India's energy sector. And there are significant opportunities. So we did kind of assess using commercially available technologies, what are the ways to enhance the efficiency of the air conditioners? And what we found is uh, using commercially available technologies, the AC load could be reduced by uh, about 50 to 60 gigawatts, by roughly by about 40 to 50% by 2030. This number is not important. The point is uh, there is significant potential that exists, but there are also significant market failures that exist that kind of make these energy efficiency uh, 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 enhancement kind of difficult or uh, uh, in some cases impossible. And that's why some kind of policy motivation uh, and policy push is crucial. Uh, I wouldn't go into details of why utilities have no incentive, but I'll be more than happy to take questions uh, on that later. All right. All right, let's quickly move on to the next part, uh, the renewable energy. Uh, so I don't have much time uh, left, I only have, uh, I'm gonna wrap in about five to 10 minutes. Uh, so let me kind of whiz past uh, this thing. Uh, so there are kind of three main takeaways from this slide. Takeaway number one is resource potential is not a concern for renewable energy in India. India has practically unlimited solar energy uh, resource. And India has very large wind energy resource to the order of about 3,000 gigawatts. And actually, Sally and I were talking about how this number 3,000 gig gigawatt came up. Uh, so the official government estimate was only about 100 gigawatts of wind potential. So we actually reassessed the potential uh, five years ago. And we found out that the potential is not 100 gigawatts, but it's actually 3,000 gigawatts, which makes sense because the US potential is about 12,000 gigawatts. Chinese potential is 6,000 gigawatts. I mean, how can India's potential be 100 gigawatts? Uh, so that kind of prompted us to do this reassessment. Uh, the second part, the second key takeaway is the clean energy costs have been uh, reducing consistently. Again, these are costs, these are levelized costs, does not necessarily mean the value has been increasing, but the costs have been dropping. Uh, but, uh, and this is to uh, respond to your point, the discussions on grid parity though are kind of misleading. So solar energy coming at four cents, five cents per kilowatt hour, and coal available at four and five cents. So now clean energy has achieved grid parity. That discussion is kind of misleading because of the intermittency and the diurnal nature of the, uh, of the renewable energy. Uh, and this, the, the, sec, the, the third important point is solar and wind profiles in India are kind of complementary to each other. And what I mean by that is I'll show you right here. So this chart shows the wind generation in the month of July. This is actual data in July 2012 uh, in California and in India. 
uh, just look at how the pa wind pattern is. So this is California. This is actual California ISO data. So, these, the, so each line is each day of the month in June. So there are 31, 31 lines, 31 days. And this is the average wind profile. Peaks at night, uh, it kind of re it dips in the uh, middle of the day. And this is India, one of the most wind rich states in India, the wow. state of Tamil Nadu, which is exactly opposite to that of California. It actually is daytime peaking and it's summer peaking. In California, the wind is winter peaking, nighttime peaking when we need it the least. In India, the wind is daytime peaking and summer peaking when we need it the most. And that's why the value of wind energy in India is much higher than it is uh, in the US. And this is, uh, I'm sure uh, all of you have heard of the duck chart. Uh, so duck chart is essentially uh, shows the load and the net load, which is load minus all the renewable energy generation uh, in, uh, in, in a specific duration. So for example, this is projected 2030 uh, for the month of, a typical day in the month of May, okay, projected 2030. So this is how the load may look like, about 400 gigawatts of peak load uh, in the month of May, typical. And for different penetrations of renewable energy, this is how the net load uh, uh, curve looks like. And net load is something that your conventional generators have to meet, your coal and gas and nuclear and hydro and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is, this kind of keeps going down, 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 but even at 33% renewable energy, which is the current AB32 target, uh, in case of India, the belly doesn't really, belly of the duck doesn't really reach all the way to zero or doesn't really go to very low levels. And there are kind of two reasons for this. Reason number one is that India's load is increasing. In case of California, the load is fairly stagnant. Uh, the load growth is fairly small, but in case of India, as the renewable penetration increases, the load also increases. And uh, with AC load and other, all other types of load, this daytime peak is only going to increase uh, going further. And second is because of this favorable wind energy generation, uh, uh, this kind of helps in balancing out, in kind of flattening out uh, this belly uh, fairly well across the morning hours. All right, so again, two key takeaways. Takeaway number one is wind energy pattern in India is quite helpful to that, uh, uh, to the demand and to the grid. And second, wind and solar kind of have complementary patterns. So grid integration is kind of a less of an obstacle uh, in India than in California. But one also has to consider the financially distressed utilities. So any kind of incremental cost of renewables we're talking about is going to be met with significant opposition, especially uh, by the utilities. And that's where the role of policy innovation and the role of newer uh, uh, policy instruments is quite crucial. All right, uh, I'm going to wrap this up in exactly one minute. So <laughs> uh, uh, transport electrification. So again, there are kind of two major takeaways here. One is, I don't know, again, if any one of you have traveled to India, the driving conditions are extremely congested. <laughs> but, but which also means uh, that there are significant benefits to driving electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles because you're, you're braking, you're idling, you're accelerating a lot more than you would do it here. So we kind of did a few simulations and what we found out is electric vehicles actually have 50% higher benefits in India than they have in US or Europe. And this is primarily because of these three factors that I mentioned, uh, braking, idling, and acceleration. Uh, second important point is range requirements in India are much shorter. People travel smaller distances and people also travel in smaller vehicles, smaller cars smaller motorcycles. So that's why the battery capacity that is required for each car is much smaller, which makes them cheaper, and which also makes them more efficient because they are lighter. Uh, and third is India has fairly strong auto uh, manufacturing uh, lobby. Uh, and that private interest is significantly ambitious uh, kind of in terms of expanding uh, their global reach. So they do want to be leaders in EV manufacturing uh, and that's why 
uh, they could kind of latch on to this electric vehicle opportunity. So now one of the common criticisms is, well, you know, India doesn't have enough electricity to uh, feed its current uh, electrical load. How can it sustain the, uh, the electric vehicles? So we kind of did a simulation again. And by 2030, what we found out is this additional load due to EV charging is a small sliver in the total electricity load. It's only about 5 to 6% of the total electricity load because the other loads are increasing so rapidly, mainly ACs and industrial and other commercial load, that this EV load is a pretty small uh, fraction. And the third major criticism of EVs, well, you know, India's grid is coal heavy, so you're actually just uh, shifting your emissions from oil to coal, wouldn't it actually increase the greenhouse gas emissions? Then no, we actually conducted those simulations. And the reason is that EVs are inherently more efficient than the conventional IC engine vehicles. So that's why if you look at uh, this bar chart, this uh, gray line shows the CO2 emissions in grams, per, uh, uh, grams of CO2 per kilometer uh, by the conventional IC engine vehicles. This shows if the grid was entirely powered by, uh, the, the, uh, uh, by coal, well, not entirely powered, but it's a coal heavy grid as it exists today then what would be the emissions per kilometer? And if it is a renewables heavy grid, what would be the emissions per kilometer? And as you, as you can see, even if it is a coal heavy grid, uh, you could get an emissions reduction of about 20 to 30% uh, on a grams per uh, kilometer uh, basis. All right, one last point is energy access and then I'm gonna stop. Uh, so as I mentioned, a lot of people don't have access to electricity and one of the options uh, could, to, of enhancing energy access is how about enhancing the efficiency of uh, that, uh, uh, that consumption. So for example, you see a system here. We have a prototype in our lab developed a 23-inch TV, uh, two LED lamps, a table fan, uh, a cell phone charger, uh, a radio, all put together consuming less than 25 watts. And all of this can be powered by this small solar panel with 40 watt uh, peak output. And all this can be uh, essentially uh, be provided a battery support with a standard 70 ampere hour or a standard 100 to 150 watt hour or a laptop battery that we typically use anyway. So which is kind of potentially game changing in the energy access debate. And I'll be happy to take questions uh, specifically on that because I don't have much time to talk, on, uh, to talk more about this. Uh, so I think I'll just stop here uh, just to recapitulate the kind of significant leapfrogging opportunities in the clean energy sector in India. And now is the time to act, uh, uh, but significant policy innovation is kind of required given those unique governance challenges uh, that I talked about. Thank you. Time for questions. Let's start with the students, mostly in the back. Any student questions? Sir? Can you comment on the potential for energy storage? Sure. Uh, yeah, energy storage uh, would be quite crucial, uh, especially with this renewable heavy uh, grid, uh, but it's also kind of limited by uh, the cost right now. Uh, but going forward, uh, especially battery storage is absolutely crucial. There are kind of other forms of storage, but uh, there are kind of several barriers to that. For example, hydro is one of them. Uh, uh, and all other forms are kind of inefficient relative to the batteries. So batteries and hydro are the two kind of commonly considered storage options in India, uh, out of which batteries are kind of on the hold because of the cost, but uh, it is kind of being considered fairly seriously a few years down the line. So all the frameworks are kind of getting uh, made right now, the policy frameworks. Additional questions, please. Patricia. So I've seen in the news that uh, the Indians, they had a new national electricity plan saying that uh, effectively no new coal plants would be needed in India, which um, to me was maybe sort of confusing given the trends that you've discussed in terms of increasing demand and a high local supply of coal. I wonder what you think about that. Sure. So no, I think so. What that says is they have 50 gigawatts of coal plants in pipeline, so they wouldn't need anything more than those 50 gigawatts planned. 
until 2027. Uh, so, but, so that's, uh, that's essentially something called as National Electricity Plan, which only has a horizon of five to 10 years. But we are talking about 20 to 30 years, uh, a long-term kind of horizon. And in that horizon, yes, I mean, you would need significant additional uh, coal capacity. That being said, though, the current coal capacity is pretty inefficiently used, horribly managed. So there is a lot of scope for improvement in that. But uh, that's, the coal capacity will still be required. Any other student questions? Catherine? Not, not yet. It's fair. Um, across, building from this theme across your plugging categories, can you talk about how you see the potential implementation pathways and where there might be openings for getting to these plugging as compared to where the constraints would be biggest? Sure, I think that's a great point. Uh, so in terms of getting leapfrogging, so any kind of new systems that, uh, uh, that may be implemented, that's where most of the uh, leapfrogging opportunities or in terms of implementation, that would be kind of uh, easier to implement because of three reasons. Reason number one is uh, c c c any new systems that get created in India, they work pretty well, at least in the initial few years, because it doesn't have the baggage of the old governance problems. So with that lens, uh, energy access uh, comes, to, uh, comes to mind. Uh, so providing super efficient appliances with battery backup that takes away the utility disincentive of not supplying electricity to the subsidized customers, uh, but also has all the benefits of a market-based uh, auctions or market-based programs where that can, with bulk procurement, can re uh, reduce the cost down and so on and so forth. So that comes to mind uh, first. The second is electric vehicles, uh, because most of the vehicles are yet to be bought. Uh, and third is uh, appliance efficiency or room AC efficiency in this specific uh, case, because it's a, it's a one institution that just needs to change its minimum energy performance standards. Uh, and then uh, things uh, will take away on its own. Can you think specifically about wind energy and solar energy? But I was wondering, what do you see as the role for the other for other types of renewable energy in the future of India? Sure. Uh, so there are kind of two major uh, other renewable energies that are being considered. One is small hydro, small or micro hydro, and the other is biomass. Uh, for biomass, uh, I, I personally think wind and solar will be the mainstays of renewable energy, and small and hydro will uh, small hydro and biomass will be kind of on the fringe. And the, the, the main reason for that is for biomass, there is a lot of other supply chain issues that need to be worked out, uh, uh, distribution systems and so on. And second, for small hydro, uh, because it's a hydro plant, just getting the permissions and so on and so forth is, uh, is, is a long challenge in itself. And hydro potential in itself in India is kind of limited. Uh, it's, it's, and it's, most of it is already kind of exhausted. Uh, so going forward, wind and solar will be the mainstays. One of the advantages of wind and solar is they don't use water like thermal electricity generation plants do. Is that uh, a big enough deal to be a driver politically in India to reduce the number of new fossil fuel plants? Uh, not entirely, but uh, as I mentioned, in a few kind of, uh, for a few local governments, yes. So for example, uh, so water, uh, coal plants using water has already kind of become a political issue uh, in a few local uh, uh, elections and a few uh, local areas and a few states. So in those states, absolutely. But as a national policy, uh, I do not think that will be the driver, per se. Uh, but it will definitely be one of the kind of factors that influences uh, the nudge. Uh, but locally, absolutely. And it has already been taking place. So for example, in a, uh, in a state called Telangana uh, in India, uh, which this is exactly why uh, they kind of started pushing towards newer wind and solar uh, plants because they did not want to use their water for uh, coal power plants. Okay, one last question in the back. Uh, to go on to the original storage question, is load shifting something that uh, is being looked at? Like, so either charging EVs when it's convenient or disconnecting the ACs at a few times of the year, the way New Zealand does with hot water heaters? Well, thank you for bringing it up. I, I forgot to mention that. So, 
So uh, the question was, uh, g g in continuation with storage, can load shifting be considered as one of the options, or is it being considered? For example, switching the charging of electric vehicles, or switching or disconnecting the AC load, and so on and so forth. Uh, g g yes, it is. Absolutely, it is. And in fact, Indian utilities are masters of something called as demand response. It's just the wrong entity responding. It's called demand control. So, uh, so, but to cut the long story short, yes, and not just air conditioners, but agricultural pumps, which is a big load in India, uh, uh, municipal water pumping, uh, and some utilities are already practicing it. And uh, from our work, it is also coming up as one of the least cost resources that can add flexibility to the system. So they are considering it. Uh, but uh, again, as a matter of national policy, no. But it's mostly at the utility uh, scale, a uh, utility level. But going forward, it is absolutely crucial, and it will have to be uh, implemented. Well, Nick, and I think we're just about out of town. Uh, thanks for a rapid but fascinating tour <laughs> of the world of uh, energy in India. Thanks again. Well, thank you, John. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>